next person I'm going to introduce, and with no disrespect in, in, intended to any of our you know, other speakers today or, or uh, any other year, this is one of these people, when I read the bio, um, <laughs> I think to myself, I go, hold on, I'm just some radio and TV schlep. And then I read a bio here from our next guest, and I think, man, what am I doing with my life? What, 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 what should I be doing more right now? Uh, Dr. Patrick McDonald, <clears throat> excuse me, is our, is our next speaker. And he's going to speak to you about ethical issues relating to hydrocephalus research in children. Uh, now, Dr. McDonald is the head of section of neurosurgery at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg and associate professor in the Department of Surgery at both University of Manitoba and British Columbia. Now, it's not just ending there. Uh, born and raised and trained in Toronto, obtaining his medical degree and pursuing neurosurgical training at the University of Toronto. He then followed his residency as chief of clinical fellow in neurosurgery at the Hospital for Sick Children. Then after the fellowship, he obtained a master's degree from the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. Then in 2016, after 14 years at the Winnipeg Children's Hospital, where he started the program in pediatric neurosurgery, he relocated to Vancouver to be the head of neurosurgery at BC's Children's Hospital. Still not done yet, folks. He recently has returned to Winnipeg as the chair of the section of neurosurgery at the University of Manitoba. He's a faculty member of Neuroethics Canada at UBC, chair of the Ethics Committee at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and he's the past president of the Canadian Neurological Society. His research focuses on ethical issues in the adoption of innovative neurosurgical interventions and neurotechnologies and conflicts of interest. So the, the, the resume speaks for itself. The background, the, the amount of stuff that, that, that this man has done is beyond impressive. And uh, we're thrilled that he took some time to speak with us, to speak to all of you today, and uh, was able to take time out of his weekend to do so. Uh, so I bring into the mix right now and uh, hand it over to Dr. Patrick McDonald. Thanks very much, Doc. Thanks, Eric, for um, an overly generous uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with you all this morning from a um, beautiful fall day here in Winnipeg. And I heard some talk about the Argos and the Ticats, but uh, there's no doubt the best team in the CFL at the moment is the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So I think, can I share my slides so I can control the deck or is it easier if we just advance as we go ahead? Yes, you can definitely share your slides. Um, you should be able to do okay. it right now. See here. Okay, I think I'm doing it. There we go. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And uh, again, thank you for asking me to speak. It's a real honor and thank you for the work that you all do. Um, it's uh, just remarkable to have uh, such advocates uh, for hydrocephalus, which um, you know I, I sometimes feel like it's an under um, you know, the public doesn't know enough about uh, how hydrocephalus impacts on um, so many people in Canada. So let's see. Oops, not let me advance. Oh, there we go. Um, so I have some grant funding from the National Institutes of Health in the United States, University of Manitoba, and Neuroethics Canada, where I work at uh, UBC. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we innovate in surgery, how we come up with a new procedure or uh, a new device, um, and a little bit about how that's happened in hydrocephalus over the years. And then end with a um, discussion about some of the issues that go along with uh, both innovation and, and any research that happens in hydrocephalus or really any um, medical condition. And you know, many of you either personally or for uh, family members or children, may have actually enrolled in a study and um, there's uh, we're, we're part of Canada's fortunate enough to be part of the hydrocephalus clinical research network where um, we kind of pool all of our information across North America in the hopes of improving care for people with hydrocephalus. So if you look back uh, in the past how we innovated in surgery it was kind of the wild west and I think nothing better uh, illustrates this than than heart surgery um, and so these two gentlemen are considered the pioneers, kind of giants of cardiac surgery in the United States. Um, the gentleman on the left is Denton Cooley, and the man on the right is uh, William DeBakey. They were both uh, uh, cardiac surgeons in Texas. 
and kind of cowboys, if, uh, if you must know. Um, they just kind of did things. They didn't go through research ethics boards, which didn't exist at the time. And they're kind of known for trying to outdo each other. And so Dr. DeBakey had invented an artificial heart and was looking for the right patient to put it into. Um, and while he was away lecturing in Europe, his, um, his trainee, Denton Cooley, uh, broke into his lab, took the artificial heart and put it in somebody um, who needed a, a heart and didn't have um, a donor at the time. So something like that would never happen now. Uh, you'd have to go through a whole bunch of research ethics boards and make sure that safeguards were put in place. And that's entirely appropriate um, that we have those things in place now. Um, and so a lot of surgical innovation in the past, really up until the 70s and 80s, happened really by trial and error. Um, people just trying things, not even necessarily telling patients they were trying something new, just doing it. Um, and for many things, that, that worked. We have some of the operations today that we perhaps never would have had without that kind of Wild West kind of feel. But we now know that there's a lot of potential harm that comes from that too. And so now to get a um, certainly a new device, a new drug in place, you have to go through a lot of hurdles. Sometimes it seems like too many hurdles. Um, surgical innovation is still a bit um, unregulated. If you're just kind of coming up with a new operation, there's no uh, Health Canada or FDA for a new operation. But most hospitals in, now have in place uh, a committee that will look at a proposed innovative operation and decide, put safeguards in place to follow it and study it um, before you just do it. So as I said, for surgical innovation, there's really no national or regulatory framework for uh, innovative surgical procedures. For new devices, so let's say someone um, invented a new shunt, for example, there is a process you have to go through to get that approved. Um, but it's actually quite a bit less stringent than that for a new drug, for example. Um, and because a, a shunt is a device that's already out there, um, you could actually come up with a reasonably um, very different kind of shunt uh, and probably get it on the market relatively quickly compared to a drug uh, because the, there's something called predicate devices. You have something out there that your device is just similar to then sometimes you don't have to jump through all the hoops uh, uh, to get it onto market. And that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Sometimes things get adopted widely into practice, either a, a novel intervention or a new device without really being studied. And then we find out later that uh, perhaps it doesn't work as well as we thought. Uh, and so there's certainly a tendency for a novel surgical procedure or even a, a new device to gain wide acceptance without going through the rigors that a new drug would. So most drugs have to go through what's known as a randomized clinical trial, where you compare it either with the standard of care uh, or with uh, a placebo uh, to see if there's an actual benefit from it. And we simply don't have that same rigor for new operations or even new devices. So kind of as a result of that, there's a, a group of uh, ethicists and surgeons that have come up with uh, a framework for how we can innovate in a way that ensures safety, um, patient and family uh, buy-in, uh, and a way that we know that if something, if we're if we're coming up with a new procedure, that we're we're actually studying it properly, so we know whether or not it works. As I've said, there's lots of uh, procedures out there that, when had been adopted for years and decades, and and then when they were actually studied closely, found to be of of no benefit. And I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but um, this is essentially the framework. So the first thing is to have an idea. I've got something that uh, an operation or, that I think will work, um, uh, but I'm not quite sure. And so, you know, ideally, if you can study that in, in some sort of a model, whether it's an animal model or more and more using computer modeling, then that would be the way to go. Um, but at some point, you have to try it out. Um, and this is where we can run into a lot of issues relating to risk when we don't really know what the risk of a new procedure is. Um, but the critical stages are, are stage three and four, where we actually assess a procedure uh, through either a clinical trial, which can be very, very expensive, um, or simply a registry where we, um, everyone who's doing this operation uh, agrees that they'll uh, put their data 
into a, a database and study what the um, whether it works or not. And then finally, and again, probably one of the more important things is, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about the ethics of research, is um, you have to continue to study, make sure that um, what you found in your initial studies that were published aren't just random chance that everyone who got this procedure or this new device actually did better than those who didn't and that it's a true beneficial effect. And so I'm going to give you some examples of, of what I consider bad surgical innovation and then what I would consider good surgical innovation that um, many of you will, will already know about. So here's just a kind of media example of, of the bad. This is a neurosurgeon in Italy uh, named Sergio Canavero, who uh, um, every month or so you'd find something in the media about him uh, doing a head transplant. So taking uh, really a body transplant because you're taking a, a body and implanting it onto um, the head uh, of a live human uh, who had some, you know, um, um, some horrific neurologic disorder where, for example, they couldn't move their arms or legs. And so, for example, a spinal cord injured patient might be an example of this. And um, he kept claiming he was going to do one of these, despite most of the neurosurgical community agreeing that it really wasn't possible. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, he said he was going to do this in 2017. It hasn't happened yet. And, and I haven't seen much in the media about it lately. But that's an example of how not to innovate surgically. Um, but here's an example that, that I think is probably a textbook case of how to innovate surgically. Um, and this has impact on um, certainly on uh, anyone with spina bifida, but also uh, the, uh, uh, the impact of spina bifida in the development of hydrocephalus. And so um, in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, a group of centers uh, in the United States, uh, largely at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and some in Europe, um, were starting to do fetal repair of spina bifida or myelomeningocele. And what they had initially noticed was there seemed to be a dramatic reduction in the incidence of Chiari malformations uh, in uh, children or infants who had undergone this procedure in utero. And there started to be a bit of a proliferation of centers across the US that started doing this, um, but it wasn't really being well studied. And so I think a credit to um, organized pediatric neurosurgery at the time, um, a group of neurosurgeons uh, got together and decided that before this got widely adopted, we need to study it better. And so um, with funding from the National Institutes of Health in the United States, uh, this randomized trial called the MOMS trial was done. And um, I think the first time this has ever happened, every other center that had even thought about doing this um, agreed that they would not, that the only way you could get the surgery was in the three study centers that were studying it. Um, and that way we could truly study it. Um, and as, as many of you may know, this turned out to be a positive trial. And um, one of the beneficial effects of prenatal or in utero repair of myelomeningocele was that it seemed to reduce the uh, likelihood of a child subsequently developing hydrocephalus. And so even though that ideal framework that I talked about hadn't existed when this trial started, if you look at it, it actually followed all of, uh, all of the tenets of the ideal framework. So this is an example, in my opinion, of how to really do um, surgical innovation well. And thankfully, it's something that um, has been of some benefit to uh, children with myelomeningocele or spina bifida. And now... In Canada, we're fortunate that we do have a Canadian center um, at SickKids and Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, um, where I think most centers are now, uh, if, if a, um, a woman has a pregnancy where they're a candidate for this, then we we're sending them all to Toronto. And I, I would predict that probably over the next five to 10 years, uh, another center in Canada will open somewhere. So if we uh, go specifically to hydrocephalus and innovation in hydrocephalus care, um, 
that I, I've always found uh, how we started treating hydrocephalus to be fascinating. So, uh, and I think many of you who are our parents um, will sympathize with this. The gentleman on the left uh, and the right is John Holter. So John Holter is an engineer. And the picture on the right is his wife and his son, Casey. His, Casey had spina bifida and um, was his head was just getting larger and larger. And at that time, this was in the 50s, there was no effective way to treat hydrocephalus. Um, and so many, many children, unfortunately, didn't survive. And um, the Holter family was told to bring Casey home and you know, take care of him the best they could, but uh, that he would be unlikely to survive. So Mr. Holter couldn't really accept this. And so being an engineer, he literally in his basement um, devised what he thought was a reasonable solution to this. And that was actually the first shunt. Um, he uh, kind of paired with a neurosurgeon in the United States um, named Dr. Spitz and came up with this shunt called the Spitz-Holter shunt, which uh, they actually implanted in Casey. Um, and it worked for a while, but unfortunately Casey ultimately didn't survive. Um, but that shunt uh, led to the development of other shunts and really was still in use for decades after Mr. Holter invented it. Um, and uh, although I'd like to tell you, we've made tremendous strides in new shunts that work better than old shunts, uh, the, the reality is the shunts we use today are very much based on the model that uh, Mr. Holter did and um, work about as well. I think we've made some progress in, in survival of shunts and infection rates, um, but uh, the, that remarkable innovation that he did um, has really allowed hydrocephalus to become uh, a more chronic condition rather than a almost universally fatal one. And I think... Um, Canada and specifically the group at SickKids has, has, and my former colleagues at uh, BC Children's Hospital have led the way in um, further innovation and assessment of shunts and how they work. So um, this was a trial called the shunt design trial that looked at whether one shunt worked particularly better than any other. Um, and this, this study actually found that despite how the valves were designed, they all worked about the same. Uh, no one was any significantly better than the other. Um, I referenced earlier the HCRN, which many of you may know about, and that's 14 centers throughout North America that uh, every um, child who has a shunt procedure, whether it's, or sorry, a hydrocephalus procedure, whether it's placement of a shunt or um, a third ventriculostomy, gets enrolled in a database, um, looking to find ways that we can improve uh, hydrocephalus care, largely through reducing infections, but also how um, shunt failures. There's two randomized trials that have, um, one that's uh, finished and the results will be published soon that have come out of the HCRN. One's called the entry site trial that looked at whether putting a shunt in frontally at the front or at the back, whether one of those work better. And that uh, study is gonna be published quite soon, probably in the next month or so. And then one that's ongoing right now um, that's called ESTI, the endoscopic versus, again, sponsored by the uh, NIH in the United States, that's looking at uh, shunt versus endoscopic third ventriculostomy with cord plexus coagulation uh, in infants with hydrocephalus. There's been very promising work uh, out of Africa um, that suggests that this is a procedure that works just as well as a shunt. Um, but we're not sure whether we can translate that to North America or where it's a, a different hydrocephalus population. So this study will answer that. It's going to take a long time, probably seven or eight years, um, but hopefully we'll have an answer whether um, this procedure is as good or perhaps even better um, than shunting, but also maybe it's not as good and, and we need to know that um, so that we know what the right thing to do is. So I'm going to have a, about five minutes left, I think. And I'll talk about some of what I consider the, the ethical issues that come up in research for anything, but we can, we can talk about it with respect to hydrocephalus. And um, as I said, some of you may have been asked to be enrolled in a clinical trial for hydrocephalus or for, for your child. Um, and these are some of the critical things um, that are different from, a little bit different from just day-to-day -day clinical care um, than if you're being enrolled in a trial. So the first one is informed consent. So 
Um, anyone who's had a, an operation went through this process where you sign the consent form, but more importantly than that, it's the, the fact that the procedure was explained to you, all the risks, the potential benefits, um, and that you had all the information you needed for you or for your uh, child to make a decision for them. And uh, certainly in the research context, the information you get is usually a lot more than you would get just in day-to-day -day clinical care, almost to the point where some of our consent forms are 10 pages long. And then the key is that obviously this has to be voluntary. If you're going to um, participate in research, either you or your child, then it, you can't do it without your knowledge. You have to know that this is a, um, a research study uh, and what that means. Um, for parents, you're making decisions for your child, and um, that's hard enough um, just in day-to-day -day clinical care. But when you're trying to decide whether to participate in a research trial, where you're actually not sure whether they're going to benefit or not, that makes it even harder to make that decision. And I think as neurosurgeons and researchers, we have to make sure that we're giving you all the information possible. And that brings up another point that's quite common in research, and we call it the therapeutic misconception. And this is something that can happen for participants or parents uh, enrolling a child in a clinical trial um, or any form of research, and even the researchers. And that's, um, we want this to work. We want a new device or a new operation to work. And that can sometimes bias how we look at it. Um, and so if you ask participants, uh, in a research trial, even if they know there's only a 50-50 chance that they're getting the new intervention, for example, um, they often think they're getting it no matter what. And same with the researcher. We often think um, because we have a bias, we want this new intervention to work. Um, we kind of think it's working, um, even though it may not be. So that's a, a concept that's important to keep in mind when you're um, enrolling in a research study. And as I alluded to earlier, the, the standard for um, what we need to disclose and um, what a, a patient or family needs to know uh, if they're enrolling in hydrocephalus research is higher. You have to know all of the risks. Um, and for a kind of regular procedure, what we, we kind of tell you what most of the risks are and what a reasonable person would want to know in terms of risks rather than you know, the, the 10 page consent form that outlines just about any conceivable risk. Um, one of the problems when you're enrolling in, let's say that trial I alluded to, the SD trial, looking at a new procedure to treat hydrocephalus is, we, we may not know what the risk is. Um, if it's a new procedure, a new intervention or a new device that we're still studying, um, we can give you an idea from some of the preliminary work, but there's going to be an unknown risk that we may not know even right away. We may not know till years later that um, this new intervention isn't, doesn't actually work as well as a shunt, for example. Um, and I alluded to, this is a higher standard than day-to-day -day clinical care um, where you don't necessarily from a, a legal point of view need to, to uh, outline every conceivable risk. Um, there's another concept um, that's, uh, as, a, as a researcher, uh, we need to have in place before we um, even think about running a trial, and that's something called equipoise. So you may notice in medicine, sometimes we, we make up new words, and I think it's sometimes not the right thing. All equipoise means is uncertainty. Um, and so that's, if we're creating a clinical trial of one intervention over another, we should be in a state where we're not we're genuinely unsure whether one works better than the other. Otherwise, we shouldn't be studying. And if we know that one thing is clearly superior, then it would be unethical to study another intervention um, that we know doesn't work as well. Um, and that state of uncertainty can exist either in myself or your, you as a, as a patient or, or parent, where we're not sure whether one works better than the other, or we think they're equally good. Or there can be what we call a, a group equipoise, meaning you know, if you look at all the pediatric neurosurgeons out there, um, a reasonable number, a reasonable and respected minority think that this new intervention is worth studying and think it works well. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you have to think it works just as well if you're going to enroll a patient in a trial. And then a couple of things to finish off with. Um, one is called the trial effect. And 
um, there's something about being in a clinical trial that makes outcomes better. Just about everything that gets studied, whether it's a surgical intervention or a new medicine, um, patients who are participating in research tend to have better outcomes. Um, we're not sure exactly why this happens, but partly I think it's because we're following them much more closely. Um, we're, uh, you know, regular follow-ups, regular imaging. Um, they're just, you're just being um, really focused on while you're in the clinical trial. Uh, and so that's why whether you're in one arm of a trial or another, um, both groups tend to do better than people who are outside a trial. And that brings up uh, the final thing is that even at the end of a trial that shows a positive result, so if we look at the, the spina bifida, the MOMS trial, for example, for fetal repair of uh, spina bifida, um, we know that the patients in the trial who got fetal surgery did better than those who didn't, who got their spina bifida repaired afterwards. But we still don't know whether that is something that is going to continue to happen in uh, general practice now that that procedure has been widely adopted. And that might be for a couple of reasons. That might be because when the MOMS trial was going on, there were only three centers doing this. So they got very good at it and they, they knew, um, uh, you know, they define, refined some of their techniques. And uh, now in, in the US anyway, there are probably about 30 centers doing this. So from a tenfold increase in the number of centers and that uh, can't help but dilute the expertise. So instead of just three groups doing it, now that you have 30, each group isn't going to see as many cases and may not, um, frankly, be as good as the, the centers that were participating in the trial. Uh, the other thing that, again, you need to make sure of with the generalizability issue is whether or not the benefits that you're seeing are just from the trial effect. And I think my time is just about up. So this is a picture of the Northern Lights in Arviat, which is in Nunavut. And uh, one of the nice things about working in Manitoba is we see lots of patients from the north, and sometimes we even get to go up there. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, thank you all for, for listening and for your attention. And if, if I have time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Eric, you're on mute. I hit the button, but it didn't work. So there we go. Now I'm unmuted. We all do that at least uh, five or 10 times, I think, at some point over the last year and a half, thinking we're muted or unmuted or otherwise. Um, uh, thanks very much for the presentation, Dr. McDonald. I, I enjoyed it, and I, I love the picture at the very end as well. And we do have a couple of questions that have come in, so uh, we'll keep you for a couple more minutes here to see if maybe you can answer these for us. The first one, Dr. McDonald, um, recently online, there is a drug being, uh, 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 there's talk about a, a, a drug development to help manage hydrocephalus. Do you know what that drug would do and could it or would it ultimately replace surgery? Yeah, it's a, a good question. I think there are a number of, of um, pharmaceutical or drugs that people are hoping will help um, treat hydrocephalus. And I think it's it's really too soon to, to know whether um, we're going to be in a, ever at a point where we can treat hydrocephalus with a medication rather than an operation. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about, but the other, the other thing that can sometimes happen in research is managing expectations. Um, and, uh, you know, our institutions are, are, and us as researchers are sometimes guilty of this. Again, we want something to work. If it works, let's say in an animal model, um, and we publish that, then, uh, sometimes the media picks up on it and even our hospitals or universities want to push that as a, um, you know, a, a feather in the cap of our institutions for doing good research. And that can sometimes create falsely high expectations where we're, you know, something that might work in an animal model doesn't always work in once it goes into clinical practice. So I think we're still a, little, a ways away from that, but there are certainly um, drugs being developed uh, at all levels from basic to animal models um, in the hopes that they will at least help treat hydrocephalus. Okay, appreciate that. A couple of others uh, for you right now. Do you know, doctor, the uh, status of the skin sensor for hydrocephalus monitoring, which is coming out of uh, Northwestern University? Yeah, I think um, the technology is there. Um, it just hasn't necessarily been 
adapted into shunts to know whether a shunt is working, whether there's uh, spinal fluid flowing through it, whether it's blocked and occluded. And I, I think um, that probably over the next five to 10 years, we will have what I call smart shunts um, that we're able to measure flow, um, perhaps even adjust flow uh, at a more um, accurate rate than we do with some of the programmable valves. And perhaps more importantly, know whether a shunt's working. So um, I know a lot of you probably know from painful experience, sometimes we, we just can't tell. Um, so I think uh, that sort of smart shunt, whether it's through a skin sensor or some sort of interrogating device, um, uh, is something that people are working on, developing, and I'm optimistic that we will have a, a usable product um, in the medium term. All right, appreciate that. And one last one for you, uh, Doc, before we let you go. Um, is there a single research center in North America or elsewhere solely devoted to innovation in hydrocephalus treatment? Um, I wouldn't say there's one single center, but you know, you mentioned Northwestern. Um, there are centers throughout the world, North America, Europe, Asia, um, that are working on these things through collaborations with uh, neurosurgeons, engineers. Um, the, uh, the device manufacturers are, um, I think, working on things. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't say there's one center that's necessarily uh, leading everything, um, but there, there are so many out there. And, you know, I, I, I'm biased. I think from a pure clinical outcome sense, the the work that the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network is doing, and now there's an adult version of that, the adult HCRN, um, is, is a, a good way to um, kind of bring groups together that are doing hydrocephalus research. So for, for me anyway, the key is not necessarily at one specific center, but in pooling all of our knowledge, all of our resources um, in a research consortium. Um, so again, I'm biased, but I think the, the HCRN, which is run out of Utah, out of uh, Primary Children's Hospital in the University of Utah, but has a strong Canadian component to it, um, is probably the leading clinical research group um, for specific innovation um, that's happening all over, over the world in varying degrees. The, um, you know, I think many of you, you realize that uh, we don't get the same press or fundraising cachet that some other diseases do. Uh, and what follows with that is I, I, you know, we need to also pressure our device manufacturers, the companies that make shunts to continue to try to innovate. Um, you know, a lot of, again, this is my bias, but uh, a lot of the, uh, the, what device manufacturers do, although motivated by trying to improve patient care is also motivated on, um, you know, the financial benefit they get from, from a, a new product that's used widely. Uh, so groups like the Hydrocephalus Association, both here in the United States, are um, kind of punching above their weights. But I think we need to do more as neurosurgeons to, to improve the, to the profile of hydrocephalus research. Uh, Dr. McDonald, listen, I can't thank you enough for your time today and uh, for, for carving out uh, 30, 40 minutes for us and uh, passing along your expertise and uh, look forward to hearing from you again in the future and uh, continued success. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.